think we should probably make a start. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to welcome members and others to the November lecture of the Historic Society of Lancashire and Cheshire. Um, as members will know, Roger is our newly elected president and would usually be chairing the meeting, but as he's also uh, uh, this afternoon's guest speaker, uh, it seemed uh, uh, un unfair and, and I, I cannot say uh, technically impossible, given my own problems this afternoon, uh, to suggest that he should be both, both speaker and chair of the meeting. Uh, so so I'm, I'm acting in that capacity on Roger's behalf. Uh, delighted to, to welcome Roger, as we all know, um, a well-respected uh, historian of many years standing, a graduate of Leicester and Manchester Universities, uh, the former, of course, uh, being one of the departments of Joan Thirsk, uh, who Roger will be talking of this afternoon, and of course, uh, home to the Hoskins uh, School of Local and Regional uh, History, a, a fine and august body uh, that needs, uh, I'm bound to say this as a graduate, uh, substantial, substantially more funding from the University of Leicester and needs to be protected. It, it, it holds a very uh, special and dear, dear place in the hearts uh, of many of us. Uh, Roger has, as we know, uh, several visiting professorships in the US and is also uh, presently uh, has a fellowship at Huntington Library in California, editor of a large uh, number of books, including uh, most recently a, a a new version uh, of uh, Tupling's classic from 1927, The Economic History of Rosendale. Uh, but he is, as I've uh, foreshadowed this afternoon, speaking this afternoon on uh, Joan Thirst <clears throat> and the poorest frontiers of English regional and local history. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Roger and will now hand over to him. And I'm hoping that if there are slides to share that he and Andrew have already um, sorted that uh, technologically and, and I uh, uh, lovely therefore there just to see Ian's cat walk past as well which is always uh, good to have ha have an extra uh, being uh, on video. Uh, Roger over to you. You need to unmute Roger. Fortunately, there are no slides, so we don't have another technological hurdle to climb. Um, as Andrew and I were just saying a moment ago, um, technology has its pitfalls, and uh, speaking for myself, I invariably fall down all of them. So uh, here's hoping that uh, today is successful. Uh, and I'm hoping you can hear me now. I definitely unmuted again. Yes. Good, good. Well, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to give a lecture to society members relatively soon after becoming president. And there's an extra pleasure for me today, since I'm told that this lecture is going to be watched by Joan Thirsk's two children one of whom at this very moment is having um, a very adventurous vacation in Patagonia. So welcome to both Martin and Jane Thirsk. Uh, a pleasure to have you with us. Well, let me offer just a few remarks by way of introduction. At the outset, I should make the obvious point that although she published a huge amount, Joan Thirsk wrote relatively little on Lancashire and Cheshire. Leicestershire, Lincolnshire, Kent and Gloucestershire were the counties she was most familiar with. Yorkshire, however, figured significantly in one of her articles. But having said that, the ramifications of her methodology and findings, her approach to historical studies, and the kind of questions she posed have a general relevance to the history of all parts of this country. So discovering more about Joan Thirsk I would say is definitely not a digression or waste of time for historians of Lancashire and Cheshire. 
And I should effectively begin on a personal note, which Bertie has already alluded to. I count it one of the great good fortunes of my life that Joan Thirsk taught me as an undergraduate at the University of Leicester. I was one of her last students there before she moved on in 1965 to a senior post at the University of Oxford, where she remained until taking early retirement in 1983. She had a formative influence on the development of my own approach to history and to my career, read and commented on my PhD thesis and much else besides. Over the years, we became close friends and collaborators. I contributed a chapter to one of her most important publications, and she in turn wrote one for me for a volume of essays, which I edited. And she provided me with a steady stream of book reviews for an international journal that I co-edited for three decades. We had a shared circle of academic friends and in her long and productive retirement, we frequently came together for meals and discussions of our respective projects. Two years after she died in 2013, I felt honored to be invited to write her obituary for the American Philosophical Society. What I would like to do in this lecture is to examine two main aspects of her life and work. Firstly, the main strands in the exceedingly impressive range and bulk of her many publications. And secondly, and I'll spend more time on this, Secondly, analyze what made her approach to regional and local history so distinctive. Thirsk's principal specialism was English agrarian history. And probably she did more than anyone else to lay the foundations and establish the credentials of that field of study. For over 14 years, she was senior research fellow in agrarian history in the Department of English Local History at the University of Leicester, then the only such department of its kind. Her first full length book published five years into her period at Leicester was the agrarian history of Lincolnshire from Tudor to recent times, published in 1957 and reprinted in 1981. In her final years at Leicester and throughout her time at Oxford as reader in economic history, she became increasingly involved in a massive multi-volume project published by Cambridge University Press, the agrarian History of England and Wales. You can see, if you look behind me, six volumes of it uh, on one of my shelves. She herself edited three volumes of this history, covering the period from 1500 to 1750, writing nearly 40% of the text herself. But after becoming general editor of the whole series, she saw the entire project, eight volumes in total, running to 10,000 pages through to completion. It is a staggeringly impressive achievement. In each of the two installments of the agrarian history, which she personally edited, the first covering the years from 1500 to 1640, and the other from 1640 to 1750, 
The essential preliminary was to depict and analyze the farming regions of the country. In the first installment, going up to 1640, this was done in the longest chapter of the book entirely by Joan herself. In the second installment, taking the survey on to 1750, the regions were accorded a whole volume of 500 pages to themselves, partly authored by Thirsk, but mainly by others, myself included. This regional framework then provided the setting for a detailed investigation of agricultural policy and practice, innovations, landholding, labor, marketing, prices, profits, rents, and rural housing. But this thematic division was not allowed to conceal the dynamics of change, which in the period 1640 to 1750 were framed at one end by the English civil wars and at the other by the beginnings of the agricultural and industrial revolutions. She ranged even more broadly in her chief specialism in the contribution on the rural economy, which she wrote for a book entitled Our Forgotten Past, Seven Centuries of Life on the Land, edited by Jerome Blum, published in 1983. And also in her book, Alternative Agriculture, a history from the Black Death to the present day, published in 1997. A 400-page volume of her collected essays on the rural economy of England came out in 1984. Taken together, it all amounts to a simply stunning achievement. It's no wonder that she was awarded a total of eight honorary doctorates, and not only from universities in the UK, that she received a CBE in 1994 and was presented with two volumes of essays in her honour by admiring friends and fellow specialists in 1994 and 2004, respectively. The University's Institute of Historical Research in London has recently established the Joan Thirsk Memorial Prize in her honor to be awarded to the best new publication in the field of agrarian history in any given year. But although agrarian history in the early modern period was her particular niche, and the field for which she was best known, she ranged much more broadly, both chronologically and in her subject matter. For 24 years, she was a member of the editorial board of the leading historical journal, Past and Present. Its broad-mindedness, its openness to comparative, challenging, experimental, innovative research and methodology had an obvious appeal for her. As far as her own work was concerned, topics as varied as the origins of industry, innovations and their diffusion, urban history, internal trade, inheritance customs, the history of consumerism, food history, and cross-cultural contacts, all at different stages claimed her attention. What a list. 
And where she led, others followed. She was also influential in promoting women's history and in highlighting the importance of women historians. An article which she wrote in 1995 on the history women was a powerful counterblast to the arrogantly blinkered and misogynist book, The History Men, by J.P. Kenyon, which he brought out in 1983. A study which almost completely ignored or denied the very existence of women writers and their contribution to historiography. Thirsk, in this important article, drew attention to the major contributions made to economic and, and social history and local history by historians like Lillian Knowles, Ivy Pinchbeck, Eleanor Trotter and Alice Clark. She could not resist labeling as Thirsk's law, the process by which pioneer women historians were subsequently muscled out or overshadowed as men took over and exercised their dominance over a new field of study, annexing it uh, to the men's world, which they controlled. Although she was never a combative feminist, she nonetheless invariably made an effort to present the woman's point of view and to bring into the foreground the sort of things that both men in the past and later male historians had bypassed or simply failed to notice. After all, as she pointedly observed, until relatively recently, it was men who had devised all the university syllabuses, written most of the history books, and on the domestic front, had usually distanced themselves from and closed their eyes to necessary daily chores, cooking and shopping. From 1951 to 1965, as I mentioned, Joan Thirsk held the post of Senior Research Fellow in Agrarian History at Leicester University. In the small department of English Local History, which W.G. Hoskins had founded in the 1940s. Hoskins had appointed her to her Leicester post but he himself left to become reader in economic history at the University of Oxford almost as soon as she arrived. He came back to Leicester in 1965, but at that point, Thirsk moved to Oxford to take the post which Hoskins had just vacated. So although they were closely linked in many ways in their academic interests, in career service, they only fleetingly overlapped. Despite sometimes being lumped together, Thirsk's approach to her subject was in fact markedly different from Hoskins's. Just as in many ways, it was very different from the approach of other members of the so-called Leicester School of English Local History before and after. Joan Thirsk was an accomplished linguist and she alone of all the Leicester local historians wrote history that embraced and compared other European countries. She kept up to date with foreign pu publications and impressively regularly reviewed books in German, French, Spanish and Italian. I know of no other English academic who did this.
Her familiarity with publications in other languages served her very well in an essay which she published in 1976 on the European debate on customs of inheritance, 1500 to 1700. Her final book project that she was still working on when she died was a study of the varied influence of the Moors in English economic and social history. Hoskins was no doubt more famous than Thirsk. He brought local history before a public which was wider than it had ever been before. Hoskins became a minor household name through books like The Making of the English Landscape, 1955, through his journalism, his popular handbooks and guidebooks, and his many television programs. But Thirsk was much better known internationally, across mainland Europe, in America, Australia, Japan, and South Korea, for example. Hoskins was a dyed-in-the-wool English provincial who never went in for long-haul travel and chiefly crossed the English Channel only to stock up his wine supplies in France. Increasingly curmudgeonly in old age, he had a long-standing dislike of London, the great when. Whereas Thirsk had been born there and lived for much of her life in the capital. She was keenly interested in the interrelationships between London and the provinces in a way that Hoskins most definitely was not. She devoted much of her academic career to identifying regions and their characteristics. Hoskins was very much against the concept of regions and its use. Local history, in his view, was ultimately about the intricate tapestry of minute local details. You could easily lose sight of all this, he believed, if the framework of your study was the larger unit of the region. There was also an ingrained nostalgia and romanticism in Hoskins's approach to history. The Industrial Revolution had ushered in for him drastic, dislocating changes, which he deplored. He strongly disliked most aspects of modern life. Government planning, bureaucracy, the disfigurement and destruction of landscapes, the loss of distinctive local identities, and the disappearance of genuinely organic, close-knit communities. Politicians of all kinds, he was unshakably convinced, were not to be trusted. He once found himself on the wrong side of a libel action from Exeter City Council for the forthright denunciations he'd made about their high-handedness and alleged corruption. And a great personal cost had to settle out of court. For Joan Thirsk, by contrast, change was an ever-present, unavoidable and vitalizing force. I remember her once talking to me almost poetically in that wonderful cajoling voice of hers about wind farms. 
Far from finding anything about them worth appreciating, Hoskins, we can be sure, would have been more inclined to resort to dynamite to expunge them as an offensive blot on the landscape. At the personal level, they were also very different. Hoskins, frankly, loved the limelight and made claims for being the inventor of the modern academic study of local history and its methodologies, which were not always quite true. Others, like G.H. Tupling in Lancashire, had traveled at least part of the same journey before him, at least a decade earlier. And some of his own contemporaries, like Morris Beresford, anticipated some of his findings about deserted medieval villages. Whereas Hoskins liked the limelight, Joan Thirsk, despite the high standing which she enjoyed in the profession, shunned the center of the stage. She hated pomp and ceremony. It's very revealing, I think, that one of her favorite characters in her last book on food was Joan Cromwell, Oliver's wife. Joan Cromwell brought with her to the capital her country housewifery and saw no need to change it or reinvent herself just because her husband had risen to become Lord Protector, and because they'd exchanged provincial living for the grand surroundings of the rambling former royal palace of Whitehall in London. Mrs Cromwell's unpretentiousness and commitment to home comforts and domestic economy greatly endeared her to a historian who shared the very same values. Thirsk, who was Hoskins' literary executor, wrote a lengthy obituary notice of him for the Proceedings of the British Academy, the longest which appeared in print. But it was far from hero worshiping. From long personal experience, she knew better than most his blind spots and weaknesses, even though she appreciated all his strengths. So what was special and distinctive about Joan Thirsk's approach to history? Most fundamentally, I think she had a restless, curiosity, was an unstoppable questioner and refused to be confined by accepted scholarly boundaries. Local history was at its core, but for her, local history was not a sealed compartment of its own. It represented, if you like, a kind of laboratory, the most manageable laboratory for research. But for her, it was always important to look out through its windows and appreciate the bigger picture. Suggestive detail rather than exhaustive detail was always her preference. She could invariably see the wood for the trees. Local history, she always insisted, should not be imprisoned within its own specifics, though she excelled at exploring them and drained from her sources every last drop of significance. 
but much more so than Hoskins, she was always fascinated by the interactions between individual localities and communities and their surrounding regional settings. These demanded careful attention. Something else, in a very obvious way, was so distinctive about Joan Thirsk's approach to her subject was that economic and social history for her were absolutely inseparable. Her approach was always people-centered. Econometric history with its mathematical formulas, its number crunching and graphs had no appeal. She rejected what she thought were disembodied approaches to economic history embedded in terms like proto-industrialization. Her approach to landscape history was also fundamentally social. She always dealt with inhabited landscapes, whereas Hoskins was chiefly preoccupied with the changing physical characteristics of landscape. Joan Thirst's last major published book was Food in Early Modern England, Phases, Fads, Fashions, 1500 to 1760, published in 2007. And it characteristically blended her keen interests in regional, local, and social history. Studying food, she stressed at the outset, is one way of getting to the heart of a people's culture. Now for Joan Thirsk, that of course meant regional cultures, not a falsely simplified monolithic national culture. And with these general principles in mind, she proceeded to explore the great variety of social and regional patterns of provision and consumption in different parts of the country and between town and countryside. She recognized, of course, that London was in a class of its own and was the first to acquire a taste for new luxuries like sugar, currants, raisins, oranges, lemons, tea, coffee, and chocolate, and for foreign cuisine. Social distinctions across the country were expressed in such simple things as the preferences for the type of bread which was eaten. Unlike today, in the early modern period, white bread uh, was deemed a luxury for the rich, especially in the South and Southeast. But among ordinary people, the kinds of bread favoured and consumed in different parts of the country varied enormously. Lincolnshire bread characteristically blended three grains, wheat, barley, and rye. Oatcakes were a staple in Lancashire and Cornwall, while densely textured barley bread featured widely in people's diet in the Midlands. Sharing yeast and sourdough amongst neighbours, first suggested, may have been common practice. Potato consumption, she found, caught on first in the English mainland in Lancashire, close to Ireland. And ordinary folk everywhere availed themselves of free food supplies from fields 
hedgerows and streams, birds of all kinds, rabbits, fruits, wild herbs, nettles and fish. Losing ready access to this natural abundance was one of the penalties of the rapid displacement of population associated with the Industrial Revolution and enforced changes in diet. Earlier crop failures and food shortages had had the same effects. So the rhythms of change in diet noticeably quickened in some decades, as they did later for different reasons during and after the Second World War. Such comparisons over time are a reminder that Joan Thirsk was always keenly aware of the continuum connecting past and present. And she recognized how each could be better understood if the interrelationships between them could be better um, examined. I see all around me the past in the present, she once observed. And my historic passions, far from fading, thrive as strongly as ever. Part of that belief was the conviction that personal experience could aid, not obstruct, historical understanding. There is sometimes a distinctive autobiographical element in her writing. When she wrote about the making of barley bread and pottage, uh, that slow cooked, thick stew made predominantly of vegetables, perhaps flavored with bits of bacon, which was a standard meal for peasant farmers, and the use of woad dye, all that was partly based on her own experiments. Joan Thirsk in her own life was every bit as multitasking and domestically capable as some of those she wrote about in the past. Home cooking, dressmaking, knitting, and gardening, all found a place in her crowded, well-ordered days. And her own direct experience of living in different parts of England, in London, Lincolnshire, the Midlands and Kent, as well as in southern Spain, where she and her husband for a long time had a second home, it was always used to good effect when she wrote about the past and helped to make her alert to regional differences and peculiarities. She developed a deep attachment to the places, even the houses where she lived, C.S. Lewis's old home in Headington, Oxford, was one of them. And especially the very picturesque but run-down corner of Hadlow Castle in Kent, which she and her husband had bought in 1954 and subsequently completely renovated. This eventually became their principal home. And naturally, she was inspired to write about it. Well, such living had its downsides. When they were living in C.S. Lewis's old house, she and her husband had to reconcile themselves uh, to enthusiastic American tourists knocking on the door, asking to be allowed to see the famous wardrobe. At least they accepted uh, that the lion and the witch uh, were unavailable. Local history did not define the limits of Joan Thirsk's theory and practice of history. 
but it was certainly central to it. Her important essay on industries and the countryside, first published in 1961, illustrates this perfectly. The big question she was investigating here was the factors which helped to shape the geography of rural industries in the early modern period. Was it simply the availability of raw materials of production, especially for the cloth and hand knitting industries, which determined their location? Not so, she found. The development of rural industries in this period, she concluded, had to be seen in relation to different types of farming community, to different kinds of social organization, and to specific inheritance practices. A Court of Exchequer case relating to Dent in the Yorkshire Dales in 1634 offered many clues. Here, it was the fragmentation of landholding through partible inheritance, which made alternative strands of income derived from industry a necessary supplement to the irregular and inadequate profits of farming. Owning and farming small amounts of land were simply not enough to keep body and soul together. And the same differences in rural community and social organization, she tentatively suggested, could also help to explain the chronology of rural industries. How framework knitting, for example, didn't spread to Leicestershire until the late 17th century. And the manufacture of woolens and cottons did not establish themselves in the Derbyshire Peak District until the 18th century. Joan Thursk had an unflagging capacity to throw unexpected light on subjects in unexpected places. Just one example of this uh, must suffice to illustrate the point. The agrarian history, that mammoth project with which she was associated for so long, is not on the face of it the most likely place to encounter insights into the spread of Puritanism. But in volume four of that history, just as she had earlier connected the development of rural industries with their particular social settings and with patterns of inheritance and land holding, so here, she linked the broad features of the consolidation of Puritanism with specific socio-economic contexts. She fully recognized, of course, London's special position as the fountainhead. But rural Puritanism, she suggested, was most likely to take root in weakly manorialized pasture farming and woodland areas where family solidarity was strong. My own doctoral thesis and first book on Puritanism in Northwest England tended to bear this out. Puritanism in the region I was studying, here as elsewhere in the country, resting ultimately on the basic family unit, was unquestionably strongest in the eastern pastoral and industrialising areas of Lancashire and Cheshire. The western arable parts of those two counties often stung, uh, clung tenaciously to the old religion following the lead of Roman Catholic gentry. Thirsk 
first suggestions found echoes in later studies of other areas, such as Wiltshire uh, by David Underdown. So Jan Thursk, I think, stands out for a particular kind of people-centered approach to regional and local history. Always keeping the bigger picture in view, even as she studied the rich assortment of local details. What factors help to explain this distinctiveness? Why was she not just a carbon copy of Hoskins? Well, I would suggest five main reasons. Firstly, as I've already suggested, the mere fact that she was a woman helped to give her a different vantage point. She asked questions which male historians often hadn't even thought about. And she sought out things in the past which they had often completely ignored or sidelined. Secondly, I think it was very significant that she started out as a student initially on a languages degree, not a history degree. Joan first retained this sensitivity, this alertness to language and discourse throughout her working life. She did not just take note of the words in her sources, she unpacked them, she delved into them. And unlike most other historians, she kept up with historical writing from other European countries. Thirdly, a lasting influence on her was that she worked for her doctorate on the restoration land settlement under the great economic and social historian R.H. Tawney. Tawney's quintessentially humane approach to his subject and his unshakable belief in the present value of studying the past stayed with her. Tawney's classic study of religion and the rise of capitalism, 1926, remained, she said, one of the most riveting and influential books she'd ever read. It was entirely appropriate that she should have been invited to contribute to the published collection of essays presented to Tawney on his 80th birthday, and that she was also invited by the Economic History Society to deliver one of the Tawney Memorial Lectures. Fourthly, another factor which helped to shape Thirst's approach to her subject was that her first post in her academic career was not in history, but in sociology at the LSE. This broadened her range, not just of subject matter, but of the kind of questions she pursued, the frameworks and categories she employed, the theories she utilized and tested and her strategies of presentation. Fifthly, another factor which I think in the long run was decisive, but was hidden from view for a very long time, was the fact that as a young woman with skills, especially language skills, she was recruited just like her husband, Jimmy, to the now legendary decrypting centre at Bletchley Park, which ultimately cracked the Enigma code 
and helped Britain and its allies win the Second World War. That rigorous attention to detail, prizing out hidden meanings, establishing connections, was an absolutely formative element in the methodology which she deployed in her later career as a historian. As her student in the 1960s, of course, all of this was entirely unknown to me, since Bletchley Park at that time still remained on the official secrets list. Well, it's no wonder, is it, that with this kind of background, Joan Thirsk's approach to regional and local history stands out as being so remarkable. Her legacy is to challenge all such historians today to go beyond the accumulation of local details. That, after all, is antiquarianism and has an inbuilt passivity. Joan Thurst firmly believed that it was always essential to connect such detailed findings to their wider contexts and analyze and make sense of them using every methodology at our disposal. And by so doing, we place local history at the cutting edge rather than leave it stranded uh, and sometimes still looked down on as the poor relation of mainstream historical studies. Local history, after all, should be in the mainstream. Joan Thirst's work always made it so. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Roger. Um, I, I'm going to have to listen to the entire lecture again, the, again this evening. There's just so much to take in. That was that was uh, on behalf of all of us, uh, fantastic. But I'm sure that will also come through in questions. Uh, Andrew, I don't know whether we're recording questions uh, or not, or whether people uh, wish wish to comment if, if they do wish to. Um, we don't can need I ask more you? questions, so I'll okay. I'll stop recording now. Yeah.